Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to take a seat again so that we can resume our conference. Thank you very much. Before we jump into our today afternoon seminar, I would like to uh, acknowledge and welcome a very special guest here amongst our audience. Um, and the special guest is Mr. Klaus-Peter Wilsch. Um, he is a member of the German Bundestag since 1998, and he is presently, or already since quite some time, the chairman of the Parliamentarian Group on Aeronautics and Space in the German Bundestag. And above all, most importantly, he is one of the strongest supporters of space, not only in Germany, but also in all Europe, but also internationally. And I can testify that Mr. Wilsch has been practically at all our events at the IEC which were dedicated to members of parliament. So thank you very much. We, of course, are very eager to hear also some uh, words uh, and some statements, some um, small keynote from Mr. Wilsch about his impression of the conference, what he has heard so far and what his conclusions are. Please uh, join me in giving a round of applause to Mr. Wilsch. So yeah, the dear chair, um, honored members of the conference, um, as uh, already uh, introduced, I'm uh, also head of the European Interparliamentarian Space Conference in this year. We are changing uh, the chair every year, and this year it's Germany's turn. It is a organization that uh, con contains uh, of members of national parliaments within the EU member states or the ESA. And it was founded in 1999 from the groups in France, Great Britain, Italy, and Germany. And we were growing, we've been growing all those years. And today we are enhanced uh, by Belgium, Estonia, Poland, Romania, Spain, Luxembourg, Norway, and the Czech Republic. And I think in uh, September, when we have our next conference, uh, beginning of September 9th to 10th September in Berlin, uh, we will welcome the Austrians to join us as well. So uh, why this conference? Uh, we do this uh, because it's us, it's, it's we, we the, the national parliamentarians, that have to face taxpayers and have to explain to them why we spend money on stuff like space flight. Um, you know, Germany especially, all, all Europe is kind of an aging continent, an aging country, and uh, whenever societies get older, they get more risk averse. They are looking for security, and then maybe the topics of raising social funds, raising pensions, seem to be more important than spending money on space, and science, and technology. So uh, in order to translate this to voters um, and uh, make it possible that funding by the countries and it's the parliaments who give the budgets um, can be guaranteed, this is kind of our mission. So therefore, we come together every year. And um, this year, of course, uh, our conference will be focused on um, the uh, ministerial conference in Sevilla coming up in November that we are also trying to prepare from the parliamentarian side. Uh, we uh, um, make, may I give you a, a short um, outlook that what our main topics for that are. Um, we are, uh, of course, um, taking into account what um, the ESA GD, um, Jan Werner, has brought out with his four thematic pillars for the Space 90 Plus program. And we uh, from the Parliament also focus on um, the topic uh, of um, first, uh, what will be the future of uh, ISS, because we think that uh, the ISS is a main instru instrument to 
make interest uh, and concern for space flight broader with all their scientists giving up with their experiments, universities giving up, industry uh, economies giving up, and um, the, you, you get more people in touch uh, with space questions. Um, the second is the future of um, human mankind, which uh, was not al always as secure as it is nowadays. And uh, we had the special luck in Germany that uh, the German ESA astronaut Alexander Grest made a splendid job there. He is a great communicator and had millions of followers uh, on his social media channels and really, well, lit up a fire, uh, especially among young people for space. And uh, that's what we have to do in order to secure the future for the things that are important to us. The taking part at this conference today here um, is a very um, um, uh, a good experience for me. It's um, interesting to see how emerging countries um, try to um, take part, to be part of this, this community, to catch up and uh, to think also in, in, in commercial models because I think uh, it's quite clear that uh, when you look at um, the necessity of funding, uh, of public funding in uh, these uh, areas, it's always kind of easy to do that when the uh, economy is running well and uh, you have uh, tax uh, income which is rather high with going from one record to the other. Um, but uh, when times are getting tough, uh, it's hard to uh, fight for sufficient budgets and uh, we are ready to face this. We think we have to take care for, um, for space debris, um, looking at all those uh, objects flying around uh, our Earth and threatening other satellites, other missions, uh, threatening men, uh, people, astronauts in, in space. So we uh, surely have to take care for this. We, uh, stick to uh, in an independent um, um, access to space for Europe. That means uh, we um, give a confessment to the Ariana 6 and um, then we think that beyond uh, the topic of ISS, which may be prolonged, we are working on that, but um, anyway, sometime uh, uh, the technical uh, usage will be over. Uh, we need other uh, topics uh, to um, make the people, make it visible, to make uh, the, show people the sense of, um, of uh, space flight and um, the, uh, um, this has to be done by the whole mankind and if you look at uh, what's NASA bringing out there, of course we are um, kind of um, dependent on those di discussions. Uh, we are ready to um, take a part and to uh, be a part of um, a lunar constellation or uh, uh, follow the plans um, to build a village on moon. Uh, we have seen that others are already there on the dark side, so um, it's, a, it's a, a good thing when there's competition and when uh, nations uh, say uh, we want to be part of that, we want to be part of that story. So um, I think uh, if ever uh, things are getting more in uh, the sphere of economic activities and they pay uh, for it. You have um, a lot of lower earth, lower orbital appliances that really earn money today and uh, that's the point where then public funding has to, has to go back because we need the money to go deeper into it. And um, uh, I thought, uh, um, I found it quite good was what Oliver Jukovic said um, uh, they, when, this, when the settlers um, started from the East Coast to go to the West. Um, they didn't just say, okay, we've been here, we will go back again, but they, of course, took the new area and they took the West. And uh, it's the same uh, with space. Um, I think that uh, we all know the saying that a ship in the harbor is safe, but that is definitely not what ships are built for. Um, so we have to encourage people, we have to encourage our um, co colleagues in the parliaments uh, to do enough uh, for space uh, for the sake of um, especially the lot of young people that are among us today on this conference for the sake of countries that see big uh, advantages, big uh, chances in uh, the field of um, earth 
uh, uh, observation of um, um, navigation, of digitalization, and uh, the service of space in this topic. I think that um, just like the um, the discoveries, the dis dis discoverers uh, in former centuries entered to sea, they did not really know uh, where they headed for, they did not know where they were when they came to a coast, but they made it anyway because it's in the nature of human mankind to want to know where from and where to, to uh, get uh, questions uh, to these everlasting, uh, 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 answers to these everlasting questions uh, where are we supposed to go and where do we come from? And um, it's uh, a destiny and a desire of mankind to go beyond. And that's why we need all this money that uh, we maybe do not long longer need for um, uh, close operations in space uh, for those uh, to go into deeper space and to look what's going up there. And, uh, and when you look at, uh, just uh, in the end of January, I was in the US, uh, the West Coast, and uh, visited uh, Elon Musk's uh, company, and um, also Branson's, and um, you could touch the mission uh, and the ambition of every worker at the belt. They uh, were, when you ask one, why are you working here, what are you working on? They tell you we want to go to Mars and we want to live there because it's not sure if we can stay on this earth and we have to be prepared. Uh, this is a, a great thing to collaborate together on that, to be part of the community and I really appreciate it that you gave me the opportunity to address you with a, uh, with a few short words and I wish for the conference all the best, good findings, good results and may God bless you all. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilsch. That was a um, very interesting uh, intervention. And now, with no further ado, I would like to move on to our seminar, which is the seminar on the next generation's view on space for emerging countries. As you know, uh, in the framework of our 3G diversity uh, focus, uh, generational diversity is very important, uh, has been uh, always underlined by our president. And we have therefore partnered with the SGAC and we are very happy that the SGAC was putting together a very comprehensive program for this afternoon. And it's now my great pleasure to ask um, Dimitir Isaya to come up. He is the uh, African Regional Coordinator of SJC, and he will be moderating and uh, be your host and leading you through the program of this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks for attending our seminar. Uh, this seminar is being organized by HIEF uh, in collaboration with SGC to provide um, the next generation's view on space for imagined nations. Um, and a bit about SGAC, um, SGAC is Space Generation Advisory Council, um, for those of us that, that have not heard of that before, um, which was funded several years ago um, to provide uh, the view of students and young professionals in the space industry. Um, in the past several years, the organization have been able to um, produce a very good network of alumni who are now leaders in um, the space industry. So before I proceed, I would like every SGC member and alumni to stand on their feet. SGC members and alumni, Thank you very much. Okay, so um, a bit about SGC's activities in Africa. Um, so currently we have representatives in 24 African countries, um, which makes us um, 
the largest network of young professionals in, in Africa. Uh, even the network of the African Space Agency is not as big as this. So we, we have a lot of students and young professionals in Africa who are part of our network. Um, and we've been able to do um, a couple of things um, in the region, workshops, seminars like this, um, to provide the view of students and young professionals in policy making um, and in advancing um, space in Africa, basically. Um, in 2017, we organized the first African Space Generation Workshop, which brought together participants from 15 African countries um, to discuss key policy issues uh, affecting the African space industry. Um, recommendations from these were presented at the UN um, gathering to provide um, deeper insights into um, policy making in Africa. And last year, we had the second African Space Generation Workshop, uh, which was held in Mauritius, brought together about 20 African countries. Uh, and this year, we're also organizing the third African Space Generation Workshop, which will be held in Ethiopia, and um, we welcome all African students and young professionals to join us. Um, these are the countries where we currently have representatives, so um, we invite you to um, try and work with our representatives this one. So SGAC um, work is not completed. Um, we, we try as much as possible to work with institutions, with space agencies, um, organizations, companies, and all to support our activities. Um, and as we'll be reaching out to some of us, um, we hope you give us a yes and support our activities in Africa. Um, to proceed, I would like to invite our national point of contact from, from Morocco. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Iman Al Khantouti. I'm the national point of contact for SGAC in Morocco. And uh, on the behalf of SGAC and um, uh, the African region, I would like to welcome you all to my, my country first. And uh, I would like to thank the IIF and the SRTS and all the organizers and sponsors uh, for the great organization of this conference uh, and the support uh, for, to make this seminar happen. This seminar is the biggest um, event um, um, SJC have made in Morocco so far. And uh, we had many activities before, such as workshops, congresses, uh, conferences, and um, uh, starry nights. So more is coming. And uh, I promise all the Moroccans here that a lot of exciting things are coming. That's why I invite you all to, uh, to join us. So these are some activities uh, that have been done before by the SGAC members here in Morocco. Uh, you can see there is pictures of Marrakech and uh, pictures from Casablanca and, um, and also from Rabat. And yeah, please join us. And you, if you need anything, um, your national point of contact, that's what I'm here for. And yeah. Here's my contact, you can take a picture uh, if you need anything, and thank you. Also, I'm gonna be uh, your moderator for the first part of uh, this seminar, and I would like to call Mr. Christian Feigentinger, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce the, 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 the noun uh, correctly. It, he is the executive director of the IIF. Please, uh, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Actually, uh, it was foreseen that uh, the IEF president, Dr. Jean-Yves Legal, should address you in this, at this occasion, but unfortunately he had to uh, leave this afternoon. He will be back with us tomorrow again, but he asked me to take this over. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, um, uh, it is always a great pleasure to see so many young people gathering in their, around their passion of space. This seminar, I think, is a great opportunity for each of you to share, to exchange, and to discuss on the reason of our gathering, space for emerging countries. In accordance with our mission to prepare the workforce for tomorrow, the IEF actively supports 
and has a growing number of activities which are targeted specifically to students and young professionals. Today's IEC has a participation um, of almost one half of, of 40 percent, more than 40 percent of the participants are below 35. And this testifies really that we are on the right way. We have numerous uh, activities that are, as I said, targeted towards the uh, young generation. And let me just mention a few. We have a, an uh, Emerging Space Leaders Grants program that allows here um, uh, 25 and even more uh, young professionals or students from all over the world to join us at our annual IECs. We have a Young Space Leaders Recognition Program that uh, distincts and recognizes uh, young professionals that have been actively shown uh, leadership uh, quality and uh, engagement in the Federation. We have at the IEC a dedicated program for young professionals that is organized with the young professionals and for the young professionals. We have a student program that is done in the cooperation with the ISEP, the International Student Education Board, a student competition, and um, we also have other awards that are targeted to the young generation like the Marina Astronautics Medal and the Napolitano Award. Within the IEF, uh, we have three committees that are dealing with activities that supervise activities of the young generation of young professionals and students. Uh, first is the Space Education and Outreach Committee, which has by itself two subcommittees. Uh, one is the Student Activities Subcommittee and the other one the Global Workforce Development Subcommittee. The second committee is the Workforce Development and the Young Professionals Program Committee. And the third one is the Space Universities Administrative Committee. And you could hear the chairman of this committee, Dr. Otto Kudelka, earlier today in the, plen uh, in the plenary before lunch. Of course, you are all invited to be part of our programs and activities. And I can only encourage you to visit our website and get to know more about the activities the IEF is offering to young generation uh, and to become part of it. I would like to also thank the Space Generation Advisory Council um, for our great partnership. We have partnered with them uh, since many years. Uh, recently, we have strengthened the partnership by signing even a, members, uh, uh, a partnership agreement. And I would like to thank them for the, all the effort to putting together such an interesting program of this seminar this afternoon. Uh, special thanks specifically here to the SJ team, uh, SJC team in Morocco. Um, and I would like to wish you all really fruitful discussions this afternoon again. Thank you. On behalf of the SJC, I'm going to give you a little card. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now, I would like to thank our gold sponsors and welcome uh, Dr. Mohamed Al Hababi, which is uh, the, the, the General Director of the UIA Space Agency uh, to, the, to the stage. Please, a round of applause to him. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you much, so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and speak about uh, you know, the future, which is uh, the next generation. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, how uh, UAE story in terms of uh, uh, inspiring uh, young people and preparing them for the future uh, as a future space uh, workforce. Uh, as emerging space nation, I think we should pay attention to the young people uh, because they are the future of uh, you know, space programs. Space programs take a lot of time by getting the maturity uh, investment in people is a key for sustainable space programs, especially for emerging space nation. What we did in the United Arab Emirates is uh, mostly uh, most of our space programs is uh, dedicated to inspire uh, you know, our people, not only in UAE, but in our region. Uh, 
probably you, you might know that uh, two-thirds of our region population uh, are young people. Uh, people less or around than 25 years old. Now, in spite of the difficulties and the challenges that our region is facing, the young people in many parts of our region are confused, uh, hopeless about the future. So we have a choice either to inspire them to, to, to go in the right path and to do good things, or we might leave them for uh, other you know, thinking and other directions. In UAE, we have decided that to invest through space fee, uh, in the young people. So we launched a number of uh, space projects uh, that intended to inspire. As you might know, that space is a great tool to inspire people. Uh, astronauts is a, is, a, is, a, is a very powerful tool uh, to inspire young people. So what, uh, what we did actually, uh, our leadership uh, decided to launch uh, you know, our first space exploration. It's a mission to Mars. Now that mission, we will not make money out of it, but it's dedicated to inspire the young people, and especially in our region, is to bring them uh, or to light, you know, a uh, to bring them to, to highlight, you know, a better future, or probably to shine the light in the tunnel for better tomorrow. Uh, through that project, we have experienced a great interest from the young people in science and technology and STEM education. Uh, that inspiring project to bring confidence uh, for the people that they can do it, they can do good things. Uh, so this program we have experienced you know, a lot of benefits and we can see that uh, the number of students, especially in the UA universities that go to the science majors uh, have been increased. Second project is the astronaut project. Uh, UAE launched a uh, space agency with cooperation with Mohammed Barash Space Research Center launched uh, you know, a, a human space flight program in UAE. Just to give you some statistics, when we launched the project, uh, 4,000 people applied. Uh, one third are women. Not old women, but also uh, young women. Now you can think about how powerful this project especially in our region and our culture and our religion, women, they are, you know, thinking to be an astronaut. I think this is a great thing. Um, uh, young, I can give you a story, three generations applied for the program. Uh, Adnan is here, I think he can correct me. But uh, the grandfather and the father and the son applied for that program. Now, sure, they will not go, but at least it's a test of the thinking and the expectation. Uh, through this program, we think that we elevate uh, the, the, the expectation, we elevate the goals, broaden their thinking uh, about thinking about space and uh, thinking to be part of space programs. We initiated also another uh, long-term project. Uh, our leadership, when they have seen you know, the benefits of uh, these programs on the young people, they launched what we called the Mars 2117. It's a 100 years project where UAE leadership put a goal. Yes, it's a 100 years from today or from last year, but again, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big goal that you know, unified all the people, all the uh, agencies, either in academia, uh, in government, in the private sector, just to work for that. This is where UAE decided to be a significant uh, participant in human exploration, especially towards Mars, where UAE, it will be part and contribute significantly in human efforts to uh, build the first small city on Mars after 100 years. Now, we all probably know that we will not be there at that time, but again, this is just a big goal that inspire people. Now, number of projects have been uh, taking in this, uh, uh, this long-term project. 
what we, um, what's been called the Mars Science City. It's a city that we will, will be built in UAE and Dubai where it's gonna be a test bit for people to come around the world to try to figure out the best way in terms of technology and to solve challenges for people to uh, settle on Mars. I can go for, uh, for more projects, but the conclusion is inspiring the young people is a key. Also on the regional level, I, just, I, I mentioned yesterday that UAE took an initiative to establish the Arab Space uh, Cooperation Group where we managed to bring 11 countries together from our region to coordinate and integrate space uh, activities for the benefits of uh, the region and also to meet the expectation of the young people. Young people, they want meaning life, they want future, and they want, you know, we help them. And I think, and it has been proof that they can, they can do. So I, my message to them, is to aim high and dream big. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I go back. I go back yeah? So now uh, our second sponsor, which is Chan Zong Peng Hua, uh, deputy head of the international business at DFH Satellites. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Okay, thanks, and uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's glad to have this opportunity to uh, introduce what we are doing. Uh, we prepare a video, video uh, uh, for that, but I think it's more than a video. Uh, a company introduced a video. Uh, through the video, we wanted to show to the young people uh, how the small satellite could support the sustainable development of the society and uh, what kinds of resources that industries could promote to support the emerging countries. So let's watch the video.
Thank you, Mr. Um, <laughs> okay, so now we will get to the keynotes, and I would like to call our keynote speakers to the stage, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Adnan El Arais, uh, Mr. El Haddan Idris, and uh, Mr. Amal Khadri. Please come to the stage and please a round of applause. So, our first keynote speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Adnan El Arais, uh, which is the senior director of the remote sensing for uh, Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Space Center. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hi again, this is Adnan Reis. I'm Senior Director of the Remote Systems Department and also Mar uh, Program Manager of the Mars 217 at Mohammed Raja Space Center. Um, today, I would like to give you a quick overview about uh, the National Space Program that was introduced earlier by His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Lahbabi and focus on the role of the young generation on the implementation of the National Space Program and also give you an update about the progress of the different activities uh, going on at the uh, the center and, and the implementation of the National Space Program. So, beginning uh, quick overview about the center itself. So, we were established back in 2006 as Emerson Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, and 2014 a degree was issued to establish the Mohammed Brash Space Center uh, to focus on the areas of advanced space science and technology and, and uh, in involving the young generation on the implementation of the different programs within the, uh, the, uh, the strategy of the center and the country. So we have a vision to be recognized globally as a center of uh, technology uh, in the field of space science and technology and a mission to build the sustainable science program. Uh, in order to maintain that sustainability, as we uh, discussed also earlier in the previous session, that we focus on the human element. This is the most important element on developing any sustainable uh, program. And you'll see that in the National Space Program, how we engage and involve the young generation on the development of the some major flagship uh, programs in the country. So the UAE National Space Program was introduced earlier. We have four main programs that include the Satellite Development Program, the Mars Exploration Program, and our Catalyst Mission, the MRS Mars Mission, uh, Mars 117, and UAE Astronaut Program. Those are the, the programs that uh, you heard earlier, but go into more details about those four programs. So starting with the Satellite Development Program. So back in 2006, um, the government uh, uh, decided to establish the, the institution and work on the implementation of the uh, developing the National Space Program. So we were approached by the government. Uh, at that time, uh, we were only four young engineers, just graduated from school, no whatever background uh, in space uh, or any experience in the world. So we were approached by the government to, to establish that program. And uh, when we sat together, how are we going to do it with no experience? It was we had an approach whether we're going to buy or develop something by ourselves. It's either to procure, which is the easiest uh, option, and procure an existing technology and try to understand it and operate it, or to develop something by ourselves. And we took the hard approach to develop the technology by ourselves. So those four young engineers did the trade study. We looked into the different options available. And uh, we were lucky that we, we selected the right partner. So we partnered with South Korea and our partner, Satic Initiative in South Korea back in 2006. We sent them to uh, South Korea, living there for over 10 years. And they were part of the in-depth technology know-how transfer program. So they learned about the satellite system in terms of how they define the requirements, specification, design, development, testing, launching, and operating uh, satellites. So the four engineers uh, uh, that, that we had them as a core team, uh, that number grew into up to more than uh, 20 engineers that were based in South Korea through the end of technology and our transfer program. And our contribution was less than 30% the first satellite that we developed, the device at one, which was launched in 2009. And after the completion of device at one, we immediately jumped to the next mission, device at two, and those young engineers continued the work, continued the know-how transfer program with South Korea, and their contribution increased to more than uh, 50%. After that, we reached a level that we can now depend on our engineers to build the third mission, Khalifa Saad, which was launched successfully last October. Uh, this is the first 100% developed uh, in, uh, satellite uh, in the UAE. So 
what's the ingredients here? Yes, it's important that we have the uh, uh, focus on the uh, young generation, uh, also investing on them, and also a very important thing, which is the, the trust. And this is what they want, basically. So we have the, the trust from our leadership on those young generation, young engineers, to build the full satellite program and the full space program for the country. I, th I think this is very important. In addition to the commitment uh, from the, all the way from the leadership on, and also knowing the, the importance of the space uh, for the country today and tomorrow. So the trust is very important, and this is what the young generation wants. So to trust their abilities and capabilities that they will be able to develop uh, advanced space systems. So we continue that with uh, another project called DMSAT-1. And here, as I mentioned earlier in my uh, first session I participated in that, we also we approached our end users. So those young engineers went to the end users, educated them about the importance of the space and how the satellite data can be used for developing different applications. So educating our end user, becoming more, much more and more smarter end users, allowed them to, take the, the, to, to go to the next level where they define the requirements. And they approach us to develop a mission for them, like the DMSAT-1, which is going to be a small CubeSat uh, mission 15 kg satellite that will study the greenhouse gases and also the air pollutant. And this uh, satellite being developed at the University of Toronto SFL, and our young engineers are in charge of developing the whole algorithms and applications and all the different tools for this mission. Moving to the next mission, as mentioned earlier, the HOPE mission. So it's our catalyst mission for the Mars Exploration Program. Uh, a mission that uh, has a clear scientific objective, which is basically studying the, the Martian atmosphere. And it's going to be the first mission that will provide this global, seasonal, diurnal, day to night coverage of the Martian atmosphere. Currently, you have more than 80% of the Martian atmosphere unexplored. With this mission, we will have this full coverage and knowledge of the Martian atmosphere. So this is, again, a mission that was uh, announced by the government in 2014, being uh, funded and managed by the UAE Space Agency, and working together with the Mohammed Barsha Space Center on the implementation of the different aspects of this uh, mission. It's very important for this mission that's going to be unique. The, the knowledge that will be generated from this knowledge will be unique as well. That's why we looked into the gap and the human knowledge about the Martian atmosphere, and accordingly, we defined that main scientific objective for this mission as well as the involvement of the young generation. So, so it's another task uh, given to us. And again, you know, after the completion of the Khalifa Saad, we were kind of in the comfort zone, you can say so. So they took us from our comfort zone to another mission going beyond the Earth orbit going to Mars. So it's a totally new mission, new concept of operation compared to the Earth observation uh, programs, the way the mission developed, the different elements of this mission, the, the way it will be operated, and also the science that will be generated. And this is one of the strategy objectives as well, the science, because we focus on the past, uh, in, the, in the first 10 years, on developing all the engineering skills, but now the science is as important as engineering skills. And this is one of the outcome that we're looking to it from this mission is to come up with the UAE scientists as outcome of the uh, Mars exploration program. So as mentioned, uh, here we have, we are working with the international community, and this is the way that we do things uh, in, in the country, that we, we focus on developing human cap cap uh, capacity building and focusing always on the international collaboration and wor working collaboratively with different partners around the world, and including the whole scientific community around the world and the development and also making use of the data generated from, the, uh, from this mission, which will be launched in 2020. So this is the mission. We are currently in the final stage of the uh, developing the flight model. And it will be ready for the launch in uh, July, August 2020. We'll be uh, reaching Mars to, uh, in, the, in the first quarter 2021, which will also coincide with the 50th anniversary of the country. Thirdly, we have the Mars 117, the 100-year strategy to build an inhabitable settlement on Mars. Uh, the Mars is the, the destination, but the the goal basically about and the focus uh, of this project basically on the developments that will be happening from now till the next hundred years on the actual uh, scientific exploration on the actual technologies that we're going to develop that will benefit uh, human today not waiting for the fruit of the and outcomes of this mission in, in hundred years so 
With this mission, uh, we looked into the Global Exploration Roadmap. This is the roadmap that is consists of the 11, 14 space agencies. We're defining all the challenges, all the gaps available in the human knowledge uh, about the Mars exploration and deep space exploration. And looking into the Global Exploration Roadmap, we identified the key areas that we want to focus on, contribute, and develop uh, within our Mars 2117 strategy. When it comes to the uh, space missions, when it comes to the uh, analog development in order to study the performance of the human going into the long journey to, to Mars and so focusing also on the technologies on the ground as well. As well as focusing on the three main challenges that uh, we're gonna face uh, and we are facing in our region when it comes to the water, food, and energy security. And those are similar ch challenges that we are, we're gonna face on Mars, but we are facing it here on Earth as well. So developing technologies for Mars would help us also to, do, to use those technologies to solve those problems here on Earth. So those are the four main pillars of the, of the Mars 2117. We're focusing on the research and development, as I mentioned earlier, on all those different technologies that we're gonna focus on developing it under the Mars 2117 strategy. Focusing on the education is very important to continue, to continue investing and uh, developing the, the next generation that will be working on the different R&D projects and technologies that will be under the Mars 2117. Uh, find, uh, thirdly, we have the enablement. So we want to also to, to build this ecosystem where we engage also universities, industry, research institution, SMEs, startups, and entrepreneurs to, to, to get engaged and involved also in the different programs and different projects and research under the Mars 2017. And finally, the collaboration, the collaboration with the international community, identifying the knowledge and identifying the gaps, working with the international community and achieving some of the goals. Uh, and one of the catalyst projects we have under the Mars 2017 mission earlier was to the Mars Science City, which will be the test bed where we develop those technologies. And also it will have the um, analog facilities uh, where we can test the technologies as well as the hum uh, human ability to survive in, in long duration missions. So here we have some of the pictures uh, of the uh, initial design of the Mars Science City project. The fourth program, we have the UAE astronaut program. And uh, as mentioned earlier uh, by Dr. Ahbabi that the UAE announced this program to, first, uh, to, uh, to send the first uh, UAE astronaut to the International Space Station. And uh, we opened the door uh, for all candidates uh, in December 2017. And you can see that the small country, we had around 4,000 applications. And we went through different levels of uh, interviewing uh, those different candidates and uh, till we reach that uh, we, where we announced the, uh, the, the names of the first two candidates that will be part of the UAE Corp. Uh, we have here uh, Hazza Al Mansouri and Sultan Niyadi. Hazza is our prime for the first mission, and uh, his backup will be Sultan Al Niyadi. So the mission will be on the 25th uh, of September uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, it, it won't be a touristic mission. No, it will, we have clear scientific objectives and we have also clear scientific program and experiments that will be conducted on the International Space Station. And we're working together with uh, our colleagues at Roscosmos and also with, with ESA and NASA in identifying uh, those different experiments that will be conducted within that uh, eight days period. We make sure that you're gonna, busy, you're gonna be busy during those uh, eight days period on the flight. So, so those are the, the, the achievements uh, that we are proud of. But what we are really proud of is this team. This is our greatest achievement. This is our achievement. That for the past 12, 13 years, today we have a group of young Emirati engineers, 200 uh, engineers who specialize in different areas of the space development and science with an average age of 27, 28 years old. And with women participation more than 40%, and all of our programs and all of our projects. Uh, we have specialized uh, women engineers uh, developing some of the, our missions and uh, working on the science, developing the applications, doing project management and supporting and, and they have a very active role in our programs and our projects. 
this was a quick uh, overview about the, the National Space Program and the engagement and involvement of the young engineers in our programs. Thank you very much for listening. So now uh, I will let the floor to Mr. Al Haddani, the, the, uh, the Director General of SFGS, Centre Royal de Télédiction Spatiale. So, uh, applause, please. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank the Space Generation Advisory Committee for this invitation and for giving me this opportunity to address you and to participate to this important seminar. Uh, it's a little bit hard to speak after Dr. Al-Ahbabi and Dr. Adnan with this very inspiring program and it's uh, opened a huge opportunities for the region and for the youth. And I am very happy that uh, uh, we are initiating this global cooperation in the region that's uh, I'm sure they will give these opportunities to all the youth people in our region. Uh, saying that, I will be very brief in my presentation, focusing on the subject or the theme of this, of this seminar, which is about generations' view on space for the emerging countries. And I would like to stress three or four elements that I think are very important to involve more uh, youth and to have a more uh, important and uh, uh, visible role of this generation of generation in, in space. I think the first one, I think the first element that uh, is very important for the youth to play in the uh, space uh, for emerging countries is their role in R&D activities. Research and development, as everybody will know, is very important. And uh, I think it's uh, considered as a key indicator for innovative activities. And the involvement of the uh, young people, students, young uh, professionals in this field is very important, so they will certainly participate to the strength of the capacities of the countries, the capacity of the region. Uh, R&D activities are also a powerful tool to prepare future. And uh, as far as youth, our young people are engaged in this, I think they will uh, bring a, a very important uh, strength to this activity. Just to mention that in some developed countries, more than two thirds of the economic growth is due to R&D activities or technological activities. Within this uh, R&D activity that you to our young people can, could play, I think that also R&D activities are a very important uh, element that uh, is uh, easily open to access technology. We now discussed yesterday and that access to technology is still to be a little bit hard due to a series of, uh, of barriers like financials, like uh, strategic elements, but as far as we get from this gateway of uh, uh, R&D activities, it's more open and it's uh, 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 give more opportunities to, to young people to access space technologies. And also I think by investing research and development activities, young people in developing countries well, or emerging countries will contribute to the uh, global scientific community by bringing new ideas, by bringing innovation, and also by contribution to a transfer of technology. The second element that I think uh, uh, young generation could play to support or to facilitate the the, the uh, uh, emerging countries implementing space activities is the internet, internet it's a little bit hard to, to pronounce entrepreneurship programs which means that if we encourage this this uh, this uh, this category of the society the young people to uh, to set up startups to set up small uh, enterprises i think it will be a very important element to uh, encourage uh, space activities space technology in their countries and uh, we have some, some, some examples that we could maybe share here and uh, uh, highlights that uh, uh, give inspiration to, to this kind of, uh, you, if you take, for example, Google today, or if you take, for example, uh, Microsoft, if you take uh, uh, Facebook, all this was uh, initiatives of enterprise that was initiated by very young people that have these ideas that seems at the beginning a little bit strange, but uh, it was very innovative and opened very important and very 
uh, large opportunities for countries. So I think that young people should be aware that uh, uh, creating startups, creating enterprises, making activities in this field, investing in this field is very important to develop activities, to create jobs, to create innovation, and to contribute to the, the, to the, to the economy. Okay. The third element, I think, is that uh, we are been uh, speaking about the inspiration that space gives to the new generation. The young people could also play this role as far as they are very close to the, to the, to the high schools, to the universities, and they could play a very important role to inspire other people to uh, raise awareness and to share this uh, motivation and to, uh, this inspiration with other people so they can contribute to the development of this uh, ecosystem that help emerging countries to, uh, to, to, to engage in, 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 in space activities. So just to, to conclude, recession development, entrepreneurship, and inspiration of young population are, in my, my, in my view, very important key elements that young people could act to uh, contribute to the development of space activities in emerging countries. Thank you very much. So now uh, we will move to our third speaker, Mr. Amal Khadri, which is um, uh, the executive director of the space program of uh, SENSA. Please applaud him. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. When I heard uh, the words inspire, I was sitting there thinking what inspires the youth video games. So I was wondering, would it be cool if we developed um, space-related video games that kids could actually use and learn about space? Maybe something for us to consider. But following from the same discussion we had earlier on about the youth, I want to talk about the space ecosystem. So there's a very basic form of the space ecosystem that can be represented as we see them. In fact, the input to any program is the effectiveness of your STEM program. Research has shown that currently there is, in fact, a really big gap between the capability and the capacity we require to support space programs. As emerging countries, we all are developing our own space programs to meet very specific user requirements of our stakeholders. This eventually leads to a space industry which creates new knowledge, to address the sustainable development goals, and more importantly as well, to drive a space economy. So think about it for a second. Imagine a future where you consciously protect our planet. Imagine a future where we don't need concepts like sustainable development goals. <coughs> By instilling a value system at a very young age will allow us to have a better understanding of who we are and how we engage with the environment. So the world is moving at a really drastic pace. Technology is evolving at a rapid rate. To give you an idea, it took 64 years for the airline to reach 50 million people. Electricity reached 50 million people in 46 years. Yet even today, in some developing and even emerging countries, there is still no access to basic services. There's a lot that needs to change in Africa. And with a concerted effort and shifting policy, it will allow these changes to happen. There's another example on the slide which talks about WeChat. WeChat reached 50 million people in one year. This rapid growth of the internet is largely the factor that's driving this change. The question is, can we actually predict what will happen in the next 10 years? Are we preparing our youth adequately for a new chapter within our emerging countries? So one thing for sure is that everything is starting, starting to be connected, interconnected. The big areas of IoT, 
machine learning, analytics, are starting to create a data-intensive ecosystem which will eventually even take over our thinking and predict what may happen. So yes, it's the era of the fourth industrial revolution. In this era, future of space systems will largely be interconnected space systems that provide real-time knowledge to our users and also create access to data which is driving knowledge. The question again arises, how do we prepare our youth for this rapid change? So STEM is starting to breach the ethnic and gender gap, in particular, addressing the issues that will transform the industry to become more inclusive. Much more is needed to be done to close this gap. STEM has allowed economies to grow, creating new knowledge, a knowledge economy, but now we need to take it to the next level. The use of space science and technology needs to be used further in a very different way in developing STEM in emerging and developing countries. Are we actually ready to embrace this fast, rapid evolution of our ecosystem? How do we spark interest in space science and technology to our youth? Is our space STEM programs still relevant for the world of tomorrow? In the same breath, there are some negative effects. In my opinion, to date we have seen driving science without a conscience is a problematic. We can't be blind to the fact that the Industrial Revolution, in fact, although it grew economies, new industries, it led to pollution, damage in our oceans, climate change. The factory system, in fact, originated there and introduced child labor. This large migration from rural areas to cities, is that acceptable or not? So the world is changing around us. We now have an opportunity in STEM to change this direction. In support of literacy on our environment and sustainability of our planet. We have to find a way that developing and emerging countries are supported adequately because we are dealing and grappling with real issues that need support from both developed and emerging countries. STEM must ensure that innovation is used for the betterment of humanity in a sustainable way. We have to create a value system of consciousness within our youth. So traditionally, STEM focused on the left brain. In fact, even today, if you look at some of the STEM programs, and I can reflect of a few of them in South Africa, they are designed and based on logic and analytical thought. There is a whole area that we need to integrate into our STEM programs to become more inclusive. We need to look at areas as emotion, intuition, perception. How do we build these elements into our space program? I'll give you an example. Isaac Newton sat under a tree. There's anecdotal evidence that that actually happened and down comes an apple, boom. Suddenly, you come up with the concept of gravity. In fact, there's sufficient amount of anecdotal evidence that suggests that a lot of creativity, innovation happens when we are at our most relaxed state. It doesn't happen when you're busy. So our education system has in fact taught us everything outside of us but it has spent very little time to reflect inside of us. Who are we and what is our role in society? We have engineered the outside world, but we have not started to engineer the inside world. If we fuse these two elements, we will now start to solve real world problems. So change in STEM is happening. What we are starting to see is that not only through inquiry-based learning, 
but developing the right skills within our youth can change the industry. Not only a hands-on approach, but also focusing on key elements like learning. How do you actually learn? Innovation, creativity, communication, collaboration, and life skills for our youth. More importantly, we need to understand that every action we take as humans has an impact on our planet. We need to start reflecting inside. So we see many countries, there's a shortage of youth wanting to take up careers in science. In South Africa in particular, we have this problem. We have a lot of bursaries and scholarships, both from universities and the private sector, but we don't have enough takers. The students that are coming out of high school are not adequately qualified to take on engineering studies. In fact, we've seen a significant drop in youth choosing STEM-related careers. So we needed to do something different. We needed to create something, something more exciting, particularly to um, high school students. A hook, something to capture you on the concept of science and space. So just like Lego, we have a company in South Africa called Mido that looked at how do we bring this closer to the youth? So we developed little square electronic components. These are little circuits that you can join together, take them together, and build interesting things. In fact, all you need is your hands. You can build electronic electric circuits. You can use it for modular learning. You can use it for controlling your appliances using Google Home, Alexa. But more importantly, you can use this technology, as I will demonstrate to develop satellites. So imagine building your first satellite at the age of 16. Now, isn't that kind of cool? Would that not encourage our youth to pursue careers in space science and engineering? As an example, we had 16 schools in the Western Cape of South Africa collaborating on what we call a thinset. Phase one of the program reached hundreds of students with hands-on exposure. These schools are able to share their data with schools in the United States on a collaboration of developing a big data project and exposing our youth to an important area of data science. It's introducing programming and data analysis. These are some of the skills we require in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. The third set, in fact, is quite small. It's like a slice of bread. So South African students using X in a box, or what we call X chips, built one of these Pico satellites, which forms part of 55 student thin set constellation and was deployed at an orbit of 250 kilometers. So we had liftoff at 4.46 p.m. on April 17. They'll stay up there for about 10 days, coming down soon. But here's the thing. The technology that went into the thin set, which is actually the payload, was completely built and designed in South Africa and being used by our colleagues in the United States. We need to develop STEM programs for emerging countries similar to this that will allow not only the development of very cool technology like thin sets, but also the ability to develop different skills, including data science, artificial intelligence through this process. We are now starting to look at opportunities that can be created by using a specific methodology and approach. So if you remember the ecosystem, it is important that STEM has a pipeline to absorb students into the system. This will educate them on space science and technology. To do this, in Africa, we have established what we call the Pan-African University. It's a full academic program that consists of masters and PhDs. This will officially be launched in 2020. Africa needs more programs like these that can support our youth and eventually support our space program. 
So the students that are on these programs, they start with STEM. They eventually finish university. They develop their practical knowledge further with a program such as the Pan-African University program. So we currently see in South Africa, there's a lot of technology being developed. We have a space industry. In fact, some of the technology is being used in missions around the world. I give you by example, we have a company called New Space that's developing talk rods. Talk rods are going into the One Web constellation. We have companies developing sophisticated images like Samara. We recently launched a satellite in December, ZEQ2. If you Google it, you'll find a bit more information on that. But ZEQ2 developed master's students. What it also did, it had two payloads. One is automatic identification system, so we can track vessels. The second part is a payload, an imager, which we call the K-line imager. So if you go to your periodic table and you look at K, it's potassium. What the CSR have done, they have developed an imager that essentially picks up emissions of potassium when you have fires. So now you start dealing with fire detection. Now this is all cool stuff and we're developing cool technology. But can we sustain this development? Do we have a throughput or sufficient amount of youth going through STEM, having an academic education and being integrated into the broader ecosystem? We have to ask ourselves, is that happening? And if it's not happening, we have to do something about it. So, here's, here's a challenge. We are all familiar with Maslow's Pyramid. The challenge in some developing and emerging countries is that we're still thinking of survival. We actually are. If you actually go to some of the African countries, you realize we don't have basic services. It's very difficult to think of betterment of society when you can't get the basics. So we are still looking to provide these basic needs to our communities. This is a responsibility of our governments. But our children, they are innocent and they are ready to learn. We do have an opportunity though with our youth to start a conversation about Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African word. The essence of being human. Ubuntu speaks particularly about the fact that you exist, that you can't exist as a human being in isolation. It speaks about our interconnections. You can't be human all by yourself when you have this quality called Ubuntu. We think of ourselves far too frequently as just individuals, separated from one another, where is you are connected, what you do affects the whole world. When you do well, it spreads out. It is for the whole of humanity. With all of these issues, we have an opportunity now in space as a platform to move up the pyramid and to use space to encourage STEM with a conscience. So where to from here? We need to focus on several aspects. This starts with the development of teachers through a systematic process that will instill confidence in maths and science and renewed teaching methodologies. If you don't develop the right methodologies, then teachers cannot communicate effectively to our children. We need a methodology on how to bridge the gap of space and humanity that will allow us to have teachers who become more than teachers. They become champions of STEM with a conscience for our youth. So there's a very big gap, particularly in South Africa, when it comes to parent involvement. Unless children have access to involved parents, guardians who encourage them to read, debate, take part in stimulating interaction, dialogue, they're going to struggle to embark on a critical journey of self-discovery. The start of children's understanding of who am I, where can I go in life, begins at home. We need to support and empower parents who might not have formal education to still be in a position to assist their children to succeed at school. 
young youth today, there are people far wider and deeper exposure is required to role models who are examples of success. They need to be able to engage with jobs and companies who they normally don't get any exposure to. And this is particularly relevant in the African context. The next generation of space are responsible now to start this movement. We need a cohesive strategy of using space science and technology as an enabler to STEM. This encompasses both the fourth industrial revolution, aspects of sustainability, and our role in human society. Education is the single greatest obstacle to socioeconomic development, particularly in South Africa and probably in other developing emerging countries. So how do we use this discipline of space to fix early childhood development and primary school education? Creating viable and affordable adult education programs, developing more flexibility and new curriculum to support youth unemployment, the skills we require for the fourth industrial revolution. Remember, the fourth industrial revolution is on the horizon. We have to provide young people with ways to acquire globally equivalent skills. We cannot see STEM in isolation. We need to incorporate humanity in our thinking. This will result in science with a conscience, which will enable our future scientists and engineers to develop with a great understanding of its role to ensure we have a sustainable future for all. If we get this right, we may never need to create concepts like sustainable development goals. This will self-correct with the right programs targeting the youth of this world. So, in conclusion, I'll leave you with a question. In fact, do this. Take out your phones, tablets, and put a reminder on there during lunchtime, every day, 12.30 or 1 o'clock, for the entire year, and put this question. What is my purpose and role in STEM and space? Keeping the narrative in mind, start to look at STEM in a more inclusive way, not just a program, but on how this can change the ecosystem that supports our need in space science and technology for a sustainable planet. And those that you are brave enough, let's start posting on social media platforms. I leave you with a Twitter handle, hashtag Ubuntu STEM for all. Thank you. Uh, so now, uh, let's move to our special guest. Uh, it's General Charles Bolden. He's a former NASA administrator and astronaut, and he will be talking to us from Washington, DC, and I heard that he's so excited about this seminar. So, uh, where is he? Hello. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good, what about you? Very good, and it's good to see uh, many of my dear friends there. I, I noticed uh, Dr. Aaron Freund and, and my colleague from the UAE, Dr. Al Hababi, and um, several others. So I've enjoyed listening to the speakers so far. Okay, so I present myself. I'm the National Point of Contact of Morocco for Space Generation. My name is Iman. And I will be having this interactive um, session with you. Okay. Very good. I'm looking forward yeah. to it. And you, 
I have to admit, though, you've got all the experts in the room there, so I may, I may refer to some of them to, to answer the hard questions. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Mr. Charles, or General Charles, uh, what is your view and um, the ways to inspire uh, the African and uh, Moroccan youth leaders uh, to persist in order to make their dreams come true, their space dreams come true? Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we have tried to do, that I've tried to do personally, is, um, is become a better storyteller about the things, the experiences that I've had and, and the opportunities for young men and women uh, uh, from all walks of life to, uh, to get engaged in the, the STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math endeavors that, uh, that I happen to, to, to have fallen upon. I'm not one who, who had a lifelong dream of becoming an astronaut. I think some of you who have heard me talk before know that I grew up in the segregated South here in the US, in Columbia, South Carolina. So becoming an astronaut was something about which I never dreamed. And um, I must say that I am here today because I met and talked with a, a, an incredible young man by the name of Dr. Ron McNair, who we lost on the, when we lost Challenger back in 1986. But um, I'm one who believes that uh, it's really hard for kids to, to dream about something that they can't see or to identify and want to be something that they don't see anyone like them. So I think it's most important that, that uh, all of us who represent the various racial, uh, ethnic, national, gender, religious persuasions here in the room uh, be willing to step forward, tell our story to young people and, and let them know how much, how much excitement, fun, and challenge we find in uh, the science-related areas of study where we have, happen to have come. Okay, so I guess you have heard about uh, the African Space Agency establishments, right? I uh, have. As a matter of fact, when, we, uh, when I attended IAC, uh, the International Astronautical Congress, a number of years ago that was hosted in Cape Town, South Africa, it was the first time that as the NASA administrator, I had an opportunity to meet uh, with uh, the heads of five African space agencies, which um, I have to admit, most of us found absolutely phenomenal because uh, in our ignorance, we did not even realize that, that there were African space agencies among the, the 50 some odd African nations. Um, you know, Dr. Malinga was, was the head of the space agency at the time, and, uh, but today they're incredibly uh, well led by Dr. Mansami. Uh, but it was at that time that, that we talked to them about the potential for collaborating with the U.S. Uh, and particularly NASA in areas of everything from STEM education all the way up to human spaceflight. And, and I've been, because of my efforts with the U.S. State Department this year as a State Department Science Envoy for Space, I've had an opportunity to return to the continent, uh, visit both Ethiopia and South Africa, and again, talk to young people um, in Johannesburg, Pretoria, Cape Town, uh, Addis Ababa about, uh, you know, the, the fact that they can have the same dreams that many others have had, and that even though they may not have that dream right now, they can follow my example, which is to fall into this thing. Okay, so what is your perspective about the involvement of the next generation uh, in making this space agency and, um, and how they can involve in the space applications, entrepreneurship, the policy makings, uh, in order to make this agency as best as it can be? Well, you know, I think uh, you represent our, 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 not necessarily last, but our best hope for reaching the young generation. What the Space Generation Advisory Council has done in its years of existence have been nothing short of phenomenal because you represent youth from around the world. Um, you know, I think your membership now is in the, uh, I, I'll get the number wrong, so I won't guess, but I know it's more than 10 million, uh, probably more than 100 million by now, but, but having people like you and uh, the former head of, of uh, SGAC, um, Ariane Cornell, who's now, uh, you know, the voice of, of Blue Origin, 
uh, having you all talk to your peers about why you're excited about being in this, this field of space will do far more than any of us old people can do uh, by talking about our experiences. I, I always enjoy listening to introductions that I get from people when they want to talk about the things that I've done in, uh, during the conflict in Vietnam and what I did in the days of the space shuttle. That's old history. And uh, you know, you, you and your generation want to talk about contemporary kinds of things and what you can do to make a difference. Um, the, 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 mo the previous speaker talked about what's my purpose, uh, asking yourself that question. I, I always throw in another question is, why do I want to do anything? And uh, so those are kind of questions that I think your generation should continually ask yourself. And, uh, and SGAC, I hope, will continue to reach out to students uh, and young professionals around the world to get them interested in what, what you all find to be very exciting and, and, as a matter of fact, very enlightening. OK, thank you. And um, I have another question. Uh, how to, to get more young peoples all over the world in the emerging countries to overcome the difficulties and, o and aim toward the cooperation maybe between the, those emerging countries in the field? You know, that's, um, I, my answer here may be a little controversial, but I'm going to use uh, the example of some of the nations with whom I, I had the privilege of working while I was the NASA administrator. And I, to be quite honest, I don't think there is any better example. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, Dr. Al-Ababi is still there in the audience, but if he is, um, I would say that some of you in the young generation should, should bend his ear uh, or bend the ear of, uh, of Dr. Pascal Ehrenfreund, who is there from DLR, um, because they have stepped forward and, um, and done courageous things to bring forth underrepresented minorities. And by that, I mean uh, people of, of, um, of other uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, women, people who were previously ignored or left out of, of our field of space endeavors. Um, I brag about the UAE quite a bit uh, and the, the work that they have done in bringing women to the fore in the space arena. If you look at their ministers today, um, I'm not sure whether it's a majority, but a, a, a significant number of the leaders in the UAE uh, are women, to include my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sarah Bent uh, Alamiri, who is the Minister of State for Advanced Science. Um, I, I think the leaders in, this, in the room right now are the ones that, that bear the responsibility for um, taking an active part and being deliberate uh, and aggressive in their efforts to change the face of of science and change the face of, of the space explorers so that they don't just look like what we saw during the days of Apollo here in the US. Um, we want the room to look more like, uh, like, like the populace of our various nations. If I look at, uh, at an audience here in the United States, I, I'm dissatisfied if I don't see at least 50% women and, and a significant number of people of color. Uh, and I think we can't rest until we correct uh, that particular error. We talked about that yesterday a little bit with some of the leaders that were there in my, my talk yesterday morning. Um, but we have to be deliberate in our recruiting, in our, in our advertising and everything to let, to let people know that, that our field of endeavor is open to any and everybody who wants to come. Okay, thank you. And I have a last question, which is uh, how uh, like as African countries, as emerging countries, how can we get inspired by uh, international space agency and uh, maybe how can we cooperate with them in the future? The, the opportunities to, to, to work on an international scale for um, African nations and other emerging uh, technical countries around the world uh, the opportunities are there. They're, you know, the member nations or the member organizations of the International Space Station program today, the United States, the European Space Agency, which is 20 some odd nations uh, from the European continent, was Cosmos representing Russia, the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, and the Canadian Space Agency. I, I would say hopefully while they're, while the, all of you are gathered there in Morocco where I wish I were in Marrakesh with you, uh, but unfortunately, I'm sitting here in, in great Washington, D.C. Uh, our weather's good today, I, I must say. 
Um, but I think while you're there in this forum where there are people from around the world, uh, if you're from an emerging nation, try to find someone who represents one of the countries that, that's a member nation of the International Space Station team right now, because there are still uh, golden opportunities to work whether it's in, a, in an education project, dominantly area, the, area, the area of earth science and looking at our changing climate, uh, experiments that can be done by as far down as elementary school kids, uh, experiments can be done on the International Space Station. Um, so try to find somebody who's, a, who's one of the member nations of the, the present International Space Station Coalition and see if you can't partner with them. And at NASA, when I was there, we had a program called the Mentor Protege Program, and we we used that to put together large business with small uh, startups. We used it to put large research universities in the United States together with small universities, per, per, particularly those that are uh, minority-serving institutions, um, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and the like. Um, so. Consider yourself a startup if you're from one of these emerging nations, and go grab uh, go, go grab Dr. Aaron Freund by the hand and say, "How do I collaborate with DLR?" or or grab Dr. Al Habibi and say, "How do I collaborate with the UAE?" Or um, know there is someone there from the U.S. State Department. Not sure whether there's anybody there from NASA, but but try to find them and say, "Hey, look, I'm I'm interested in collaborating with you. How do I do it?" And if all else fails, send me a note. Uh, Everybody there knows how to get in touch with me. My wife says, please don't do that. But, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm always available to try to put you in touch with, with the right people. But it's a matter of your taking the initiative to let people know that, that you are interested in getting into this field of endeavor. And, and the big thing is, for those of you who are, who are young and still trying to work your way into it, uh, don't forget, you've got to study really hard. And, and uh, it's hard work to get where many of the people there in the room are today. And you've got to work hard at it. And perhaps the most important thing is you cannot let the fear of failure uh, keep you from from trying something that you want to do. You have to be uh, you have to be risk risk tolerant. Uh, you know we we have a, a phrase that that is credited to NASA that failure is not an option. I don't believe that. Uh, failure is an absolute necessity if we want to keep moving forward. I don't I don't I ask you to go out and endeavor to fail to try to fail. But I do ask you to continue to try more and more uh, increasingly risky things, increasingly difficult challenges. And when failure comes, not if it comes, but when failure comes, uh, that's, that's when things really get started. That's when you, you find out that you can pick yourself up and dust yourself off and get back in the game. Uh, if we had stopped after we lost Challenger and after we lost Columbia, uh, you know, I, there is no telling where, where we'd be today in terms of the international community with the International Space Station. So, you can't let failure keep you from doing the kinds of things you want to do. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inspiring many faces. And I can see a lot of people are smiling and everything. And I would also uh, would like to thank the US Embassy for making this possible today, for bringing uh, Mr. Charles Bolden remotely uh, and uh, making him speak and sort of interact with us here. So uh, coming up, we will have uh, the working groups. And I would like um, uh, the national point of contact of Tunisia, uh, Rania Tukebri, uh, to join me and to do the introduction of the working groups. Rania, the floor is please. <laughs> thank you, Iman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bolden, for being with us today. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, and th thanks to all the folk there in the room. And uh, I look forward to seeing most, if not all, of you here in Washington, D.C. next fall for uh, 2019. Looking forward to Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, so uh, now we're going to do our workshop. Uh, so it will be like a workshop for around one hour and uh, in order to exchange ideas and experiences. Uh, so it's going to be um, around five topics, five working groups around the uh, how to involve emerging countries for the space sector. And each uh, working group will be guided by an expert. Um, uh, then uh, the output of this working workshops is going to be your recommendations uh, for the way to involve the emerging countries for the space sector again. So the working groups are um, 
The first one will be regional collaboration on space applications. It will be moderated by Anisva Nugisa, if I'm pronouncing it good. So she's actually Managing Director Earth Observation of South African National Space Agency. The second one will be IoT and Space Applications, moderated by Maria Gabriela Sara. She's Senior Partnership Officer in the European Space Agency. The third one will be Legal and Policy Challenges of Space Applications, uh, moderated by Agnieszka Lukacic, correct? Uh, and she's Senior Director of European Affairs uh, Planet. The fourth one will be Technology Development of Socioeconomic Development and moderated by Nivi Van Lamingham, uh, Senior Specialist of Asia Pacific Space Policy Cooperation. Then finally we have the engagement of the next generation for emerging countries, uh, moderated by Anita Andiswa, uh, Head of the Operations for uh, INU SSTL. They are all females, thanks God. And actually you can choose your working group but you should be around 10 to 15 persons maximum. Uh, it should be downstairs in the conference area. Uh, each working group will, be, will have a private uh, conference room. Uh, it should be until five. I don't know if it's feasible, maybe 5.30 maximum. And I hope that you will enjoy it. And thank you everyone. <laughs>